um, the Fast Company article that that right. that described a little bit of it. I guess that was uh, one of the chapters. And um, my background, you know, I, I told you I spent a little bit of time at the Air Force Academy, but my background leadership-wise is really in the church world and working, you know, in the nonprofits, the social sector, that kind of thing. And so I see a great deal of applications for what you have written um, for that world. Um, but I'd love to love to hear your thoughts on how that might transition to to the church world. But before we do that, I'd really like to hear a little bit more of your story, and maybe you can share with share with some of the guys that are watching this. You know, your background and and what brought you to writing the book, and we'll go from there. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, I think there is applicability, and I appreciate the fact that you you see that because a lot of people just look at it as a sort of a military story, and I think it's really more of a, a people story, a story about humanity. Um, and you know, in a nutshell, I went to the Naval Academy, went to my first submarine. I was immersed in the naval sort of command and control hierarchical leadership structure, and I thought that's just the way it was. People at top gave orders; people down below followed them. And, um, uh, you know, I was a smart guy. I did very well uh, at the Naval Academy, and I kind of felt like I had all this untapped mental um, capacity. I felt like, hey, you guys aren't really getting the most out of me when all you really want is for me to just to do what I'm told. Uh, but like I said, I thought this was basically the way things were in the world. Uh, until I got this new CO new commanding officer on my first submarine and uh, that one day I was looking through the periscope and I saw a merchant ship sitting out on the horizon and um, you may know from the movies you see the submarines going ping 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 but well, we don't do that anymore because that gives us away so we we'll always stay quiet but you like to have that c capability to ping and since we don't use it much the sonar men aren't very practiced but in this case it was just we were just doing training off the coast of South Carolina, and it seemed like it was a reasonable thing to do. Well, with the old regime, I would never would have, I never would have asked, never would have gotten permission because it's one of the things that the captain controls. Well, the captain, my, this new captain, heard me talking with my sonar chief about this, like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could go active on sonar? And the captain says well, why aren't you going active on sonar? Like, all of a sudden, I'm deficient for not doing this and totally flipped it around. And I was like, uh, I don't know, because I'm deficient. I'm, <laughs> taking, I'm not being proactive. You know, and all these things came to mind. And he said, well, just tell me that's what you want to do. So I did, and it said, fine. He said, well, why, why is that the right thing to do? You know, why is it okay now? And I told him, and he said, that sounds good. So... He let me do that, and then the, uh, it was off to the races at that point because as soon as I had that experience, everyone on my watch team started coming up and say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if, wouldn't it be cool if, and we, so we started, you know, we would go, we'd go ahead flank, and we'd throw the rudder over, and we'd see how fast we could turn the ship, and, you know, we'd, we'd back up, and we'd do all kinds of stuff that, you know, we would have never been even think about, but once you release the passion, once people understand that they're in control, not being told what to do, but they can actually control their own lives. It just, it just releases the brakes. And so I had this little window, and then I transferred, and I went back to another submarine. It was back to the old way. But I always remembered, and I said, you know what? When I get a chance to do something, I want to be like that guy. I want to be uh, like, uh, his name was Mark Palaya. I want to be like Mark. And when I got to the Santa Fe, I had an opportunity to practice that because um, I was the commander and the ship was doing very poorly. And my bosses basically said, hey, whatever it takes. And, right. Uh, the funny thing is I went in with the idea that I was going to give people control. But what happened was as soon as I got there, um, everyone was looking at me. I'm the commander of a nuclear-powered submarine. I was cool. And so I would say... <laughs> get underway and the ship would get underway and I would say um, uh, you know submerge the ship and when we'd all go below and submerge the ship we would dive below the Pacific Ocean I'd say hey let's go ahead flank and the ship would go ahead flank and it was you know incredibly you know powerful and awesome uh, and so even though I had this idea that I want to give people control I found myself wrapped up in um, in, in this, this power 
And in the, the authority, it's just sort of naturally, I said, oh, well, you know, whatever. This feels really good. And then something <laughs> happened. Uh, what happened was we, um, I, I encouraged the officer deck to make an order that he, did, that he made, uh, which was illogical. This particular submarine did not have the ability to do what, what, what I asked him to do. Right. And he knew it. But the scary thing was he ordered it anyway. And when I said, why did you do that? He said, because you told me to. It's not, like, not like I'm embarrassed and you right. told me to, but this is how it is. Right. And that's the moment I realized, you know what, I, I've gone off the rails. I've forgotten the power. And we got everyone together and we said, look, we got to flip it upside down. And so, yeah. and that's the space of the story in this book. That's that's wild that, that that happened. Now tell me if if you don't mind, can we go back to the second sub? You know your your first sub. You said you had a yeah the the CO yeah. that so the first sub I had this glimpse. And I went to the next submarine, which was the Will Rogers, and I was the engineer, which is a is a tough job. <laughs> and uh, it was back to the do what you're told kind of leadership. What was that? What was that like for you as a as a leader, having tasted that, and how did you survive? I mean, it it, it was mind-numbingly dispiriting. It mm -hmm. was suicidally bad. And uh, what was worse was it, I was in the engineer, so I was in the middle of the organization. There was the second in command and the captain above me, and I had this department of about sixty guys. And I tried to implement this. Um, idea of giving people control. But the problem was I didn't understand all the complexities that are involved. I now can explain it a little in, in more detail, but just giving people control by itself isn't enough. If they haven't been practiced in control. And I think the two pillars that have to happen are one, they need to be technically competent, and two, they have to have clarity. And I think this, this is these are the two pieces that really apply with your organization. We all need to be really clear on what we're trying to accomplish. And we need to sort of agree and be moving in the same direction because if you give people the ability to make decisions, so someone is out there in a company saying, am I going to ship software or not? Or someone's out there in doing deciding whether to have a certain kind of um, fundraiser for the church, or right. give, a, give a certain kind of a speech or talks about something in a certain way. Hey, are we going to take a position and support one of the political candidates? Well, in order for them to make that decision, they really need to know what we're trying to accomplish with the organization. And if the church is, look, we want to stay away from politics because we don't want to alienate half the country. Right. And, and they don't get that. And they say, well, hey, we're, you know, we support, you know, we endorse you know, Romney or you know, Obama, whatever, um, you know, that, that's not going to work. So, help, help me uh, unpack this a little bit for me because in, in the church world, a lot of times, you know, we say that our, our focus and our mission is, is to spread the word of, of the gospel and, and, and that kind of stuff. And I, I tend to agree that, yes, that is the case. But I also think that you know clarity requires us to go a little bit deeper. I would imagine that in the Navy, you know, yeah. your your purpose is to be you know the best war fighters that you can be. Right. But there's something deeper for each each boat than that, right? Explain yeah. that a little bit. Yeah. So uh, in the Navy, we think about this, uh, and with my um, business uh, clients, it's almost I think about it in terms of everyone needs to understand the level of risk that we're going to accept in different areas. So it's not that, okay, everyone can, you know, if I gave, I gave everyone a test, what's the purpose of the submarine? We're here to support the Constitution, uh, you know, defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Okay, right. great. But how does that help me when I'm the officer of the deck and I have, you know, uh, two Chinese destroyers over here and a bunch of fishing boats over here and I want to say, where am I going to drive the ship? Okay, that, they need to know, you know, how important is the mission? How important is the potential intelligence that we're going to collect? How, what's, what's, if I get snarled up in a, in a net, how much embarrassment is there going to be to the, to the, to the country? And, and how much of a downside is that? So it needs to be rather uh, nuanced. So, uh, you know, in the church, and I'm just making this up because I don't know. So, for example, the issue of spreading the word 
I mean, you can be very provocative and spread the word. Uh, you can be banging on people's doors. You can be setting Bibles uh, in hotel rooms. Or you can be a lot less provocative. And, and of course, the interpretation of the word varies uh, widely, right. and that's why we have all these different denominations. So um, I think if I were in one of these organizations, one of the things that I would want people to understand is, uh, uh, like, here's a test. Get your people together and say, what decisions that you make and why couldn't the person underneath you make that decision? And see, see what they write down and, and, and have the group write all these things down. Then you'll end up with like 15 or 20 three by five cards and you can talk about those and, and uh, you can attack those. And I think once you give people more authority, they may not act, always do exactly what you want, but the release of passion and intellect and, 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 and initiative and proactivity will be so much more powerful. It'll be like a tidal wave. Yeah. And they get so much stuff done. So tell me, in in the organizations that you work with, whether it's a whether it's it's a boat or um, one of your business clients, what are you finding as being the issue that keeps people from from asking questions like that? Yeah, there's. I think there's. Uh, it's because fundamentally we um, we as as humans as primates as mammals we like social hierarchy we like social dominance we are wired I mean we're wired to 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 like we like it when we come out of the Learjet you know and people are looking at us or we we arrive at the party in a limousine I mean you can't help but like that because your, your chemicals will trigger. Now you right. can control, you have a decision what you're going to do, um, uh, whether, you know, to, to the degree which you're going to act on that. It's the same thing as you like a donut. You see a donut, <laughs> you're going to like it. You can't help that because sugar and fat for our, have been very scarce and we've always needed the calories. Now it's different though. Now we have abundance and so you like the donut, but you don't always eat it because, you know, in the long run, it's not best for you. Well, it's the same thing with leadership. We like taking control. We like social hierarchy. But the best leaders are the ones who are able to sort of resist that internal temptation and actually give control. And it feels unnatural. Yeah. Well, talk, talk to me a little bit about the transition. How do you, how do you do that? How did you do that? How do you see successful leaders yeah. making that transition? For me, I was forced into it. I don't encourage this particular approach, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I was vectored over to the Santa Fe at the last minute. So I trained for a year to go to one ship, and at the last minute I went to Santa Fe, which is a different submarine I'd ever served on. Okay. So I show up, and in the nuclear Navy, um, your authority is, is vested in your ability to know everything, your technical knowledge. You walk around the submarine, I could point at a piece of gear and say, hey, how does that work? And they would tell well, I could keep asking questions until basically they didn't know the answer, but I did. And you, know, I said, well, and you win. Yeah, exactly. Let me tell you how it works. <laughs> well, I was asking questions to be questioning. I was asking questions so they knew. And then what I realized when I went to this new ship is I actually didn't know. And so now I started asking questions to be curious, and I was asking questions so that I knew. And that really flips things around. And there's this vulnerability when you, as, a, as the boss, say, you know what, I don't know everything. Um, I, need, you know, I need some help here. But again, what I found was that the power of, um, of expressing that vulnerability and being honest, because, oh, by the way, they already know that. Okay, they all know it already. So all you're doing is, is gaining credibility by acknowledging it. So, for example, our meetings, we had real meetings. We had conversations. We didn't have just a meeting where we pretended to make a decision and you all there were window dressing to legitimize the decision that's already been made. Uh, that's what most meetings are. Uh, right. We actually had a real conversation. When, when we took tests uh, on every other submarine, the, the, the top guy in the organization, the, the commanding officer, exempted himself from taking the, the tactics exam because we couldn't risk the fact that he might not, you know, that he didn't, wouldn't get 100 and that everyone else would realize he would know everything. Well, guess what? I took the test. I never got the highest score. And when it came time to shoot torpedoes, when I said, shoot tube two, do you think a guy in the corner of the control room said, oh, but Captain, I last passed the exam. I got a higher score than you. I'm not sure that you're really the guy for this. 
No, that didn't happen because it's easy. We go into that mode easily. We don't need any help going in that mode. But that's a very rare. What we need help is the other 99.9% .9 of the time when what we want is for people to think. That's the key. Yeah. So talk, talk to me about that. One of the things that, that I do with church leaders is we, we talk a lot about thinking critically and, and asking questions like why and, and that kind of thing. And one of the things that I really appreciated about your book is your discussion. I'm talking about developing a questioning attitude amongst your crew. Yeah, And that's not something you hear talked about in the military much, stereotypically, right? Right. Well, you know, people don't, people don't like to be questioned. People don't like, uh, our natural instinct is I want people around me that, that you know, I say, hey, well, hey, I, uh, I think we should go to the far side of that island over there. What do you guys think? Oh, yeah, Captain, that's the best idea ever. That's brilliant, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, I flipped that on its head. So first of all, I wouldn't say that. I would talk last. I would say, well, what do you guys think? And, the second, and then so they would guess. They would say, well, what do you think? My, what do you, what's the boss want to hear? So let's sort of guess, right? And so that, that, that happened the first couple of times. And I said, you know what? You all are fired because I already know what I think. I don't need you to tell me what I think because I already know what I think. So if you're just going to tell me what I think, why are you even here? You know, go home. Uh, so that's... That turned things around, and then, and then when they realized that they could say, uh, we would have vehement arguments. We should go here, we should go here, we should go here. And that at the end, when we made a decision, it wasn't like, oh, remember, you were the dumb guy that said you wanted to do the other thing. And if it didn't work out and it turned out the other thing was maybe better, people didn't come and say, oh, look, uh, see, I was, I was right. It wasn't like that because he had this environment of trust. Um, so... What, what did it I got take? Off track on the question, but <laughs> that, that, that's fine. What, what did it take you to develop that environment of, of trust? Well, I'm glad uh, glad you got off track. Is the, yeah. It... <laughs> um, okay, there were two things here. The two things that I want to say. First is, uh, this is not a situation where you give control and then become uninvolved. Okay, people. That's good. People, uh, you know, there's a thing. Okay, he gave control, but he was sort of, you know, sitting in a stateroom reading a book. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I spent more time walking around the submarine and talking to people. And so w this is what bothered me. Um, I would come up to a technician who was doing maintenance, and I would say, "Hey, you know, what are you doing? Blah blah blah. Can you show me? You know." And I would be learning. And sometimes they would say, "Well." Captain, don't you trust me? Why are you asking me these questions? And I realized my answer to that after a while, uh, because that really bothered me, because I did trust him, but my answer to that was there are two things. When I say I trust you, when you tell me that there's a flag behind me on the wall, uh, that you honestly believe that there's a flag behind you on the wall, that's trust. Now, in the time that you and I have been talking, someone might have come around the corner and taken the flag and gone away. Right. But you still believe there's a flag on the wall, but it's not there anymore. Whether the flag is there or not is nothing to do with trust. That's just a simple physical fact. So, so is this the right switch to replace in the reactor? Is, 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 this, the, is this where the enemy is? That's just a fact. It's the enemy's either there or not, or not there. There's no trust associated with that. Um, people wrap up this idea of, of competence with trust, and it's not. Trust is like, if you say, I think the enemy is here, then you believe the enemy is there. That doesn't mean the enemy is actually there. And so that was one, one thing we got around it. But the second thing is, I, as the uh, leader, I spent a lot of time working to get my guys promoted. And just like in the Air Force, the Navy has a promotion system, and it's a point. You take a test, and it's a point system. And we were not doing well. Uh, and so fortunately, the Navy gives you a fair amount of data. And I'm, I'm kind of a data geek, so I, put, I made these big spreadsheets <laughs> and analyzed it, and I could figure out, and I could show the crew why exactly they weren't being promoted. And generally, it came down to the, the test. And so that was good because that was something we could control. And so the next promotion cycle... We, we, we knew what to study because we knew what areas they did poorly in. We gave them time to study. We incorporated, uh, there was like the advancement exam was one thing, and then the, what we did on the submarine to actually drive it was, was told, there was no overlap between these two bodies of knowledge. So we, would, we integrated the two. So 
the kinds of things you learn. When we had to repair the radar, we said, okay, this is not, there, there are questions on the advancement exam for radar. So, yeah, one guy will, can repair it, but then let's get the whole division together and talk about what happened, blah, blah, blah. Well, um, and I would sit down with every guy who didn't get advanced, and I would go over with them. We sort of create, you know, I'd say, hey, here's what I, here's what I see. Over to you. You've got to create your plan. The result was uh, on Monday... Uh, yeah, I could go out and say, you know what, Chief, that was the worst thing I've ever seen. But he wouldn't get personally hung up about it because he knew that on Saturday and Sunday, I was working my butt off to get that guy and his guys promoted. And so he said, you know, this is not a personal attack on me. We're just talking about, hey, shooting the torpedo didn't go as well as we wanted it to. And so that creates an environment where criticism can happen. And, and if you can't have criticism, you're never going to get any better. Yeah, you, you created enough of a relationship with them that they trusted your intentions. It sounds as like what you're saying. Yeah, I, I I think so because now it's us. We're in it together. It's a team. We're in it together, and the bad guy is the you know. I, I joke in the Pentagon. You know, the bad, when you're in the Navy, the bad guy's the Air Force. It's all about the budget, <laughs> right? But we say, you know, the bad guy really is people who want to do harm to 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 our nation and our way of life. So. Um, uh, so, so you create this environment. Uh, I call it the coll collaboration competition boundary, uh, and, and many organizations don't think about where this is. So it's where do you want your people to collaborate, okay. and where do you want them to compete? Because the kind of the the um, the performance reports that you have, the kind of measures that you use to evaluate people, are different if you're within a cl collaboration boundary. If you're in a collaboration boundary, or if you think you're in a collaboration boundary, we say all you salesmen work together but I'm going to keep track of, 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 of uh, who's got the most sales for the month. I'm going to have some kind of a tote board, and you know, all, you're all going to be represented by horses moving towards some, some finish line. Well, that's creating competition. You say cl collaboration, but you're really creating competition. So right. you, mis you misalign that. And so uh, it's okay to have competition, and it's okay to have collaboration, uh, but just be clear about what the boundary is. Generally... For most organizations, we want the cooperation to be within the organization and the competition to be outside the organization. In, in other words, we as the Santa Fe are competing in a sense on performance measures against the Olympia and, and the other submarines. But with it, I would get this thing, a guy said, well, how can the pump's not getting repaired? Because they didn't order the part. Right. Well, who's they? <laughs> that guy right there. Like, he sleeps two feet from you. Well, I so so we came up with things. There's no they on Santa Fe, but anyway, we got it. That's that's cool. That's I mean that whole idea. I, I did love that, you know, because we we love in our society today to do so much of the we they and right. you know we're I'm never personally part of the they. I, right. You know, it's always them. But right. 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 Who's they? I always say, well, who's they? Yeah. Exactly. Well, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's 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 pretty cool. I um, you know, as I hear you talking through some of this, man, what I what I keep hearing resonating is just humility and leadership, and the idea that you know you may have been forced into a into a you know humble place, not knowing the boat as well as you did, but at the same time, I think that ended up working out very well. I loved the story um, of your time at um, PCO school, I believe, where you turned in the blank sheet of paper. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I read that and I'm thinking, man, this, this guy, you know, <laughs> I've I'm, I'm been there. Why don't, why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? Because I think that's a great story. Well, um, sometimes I can be a jerk. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is one of the examples. So I had this, like, like I said, I had this idea that I was going to get my guys involved in what we were, we were going to do. And in the Navy, there's a lot of great training before you go to command. And uh, one of the things you do is you go to this two-week leadership school. And in the leadership school, one of our activities was to write our guiding principles for the, um, for the command. And so everyone's writing their principles studying guiding principles. And, um, I, of course, I had in my head what I thought, you know, a general sense of what we wanted. Right. But I didn't, I didn't write anything down. So I turned in this blank piece of paper, and they call me in so that, you know, I'm going to get yelled at by the 
know, had any luck there. Been there once or twice. Yeah, yeah. No. So I said, so he's like, hey, did you realize you turned in a blank sheet? I was like, no, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, of course I did. <laughs> so well, what, you know, uh, why'd you do that? I said, well, look, I, I'm, see, it all goes back to this top-down thing. Everybody else in that class, the other 25 people are going to command, had, wrote out their guiding principles. They were going to show up on their, uh, these are not just submarine commanders, you know, ships, right. shore, shore bases. Uh, we had a couple of hospital commanding officers. They're going to show up and they're going to say, oh, here I am. I'm the new CO and plop. These are the new guiding principles. Well, there's no involvement. There's no participation. There's no ownership. It's like, okay, so you're one of the other thousand people in the organization. So, okay, great. Now, th now I'm going to adhere to this. But they don't know anything about the, the organization. So I said, look, when I get to where I'm going to go, I'm going to interview the people. I'm going to ask them what's, what are the strengths, what should be changed, what should we not change, and then collectively. And it was kind of painful, but we, we ended up with a pretty good set of guiding principles that had actions. Like, for example, you know, the principle was timeliness, but it said, you know, we do things on time. Um, and there were some other were integrity, but you know we tell the truth even if it's embarrassing to us. And that was collective, and that was the the power wasn't sticking up a piece of paper on the bulkhead, so that everyone walking down the passageway could see it. It was the fact that we developed it together and we all and owned it. it. Yeah, exactly. There's there's ownership. I like um, I like what how you define you know integrity. It's not necessarily it's not a noun. It's it's a, it's a verb. You know, we right. tell the truth, and I think right. that's I think that's huge. Right. That's cool. So and now they're on the book. They're on the book. So people, I had a guy the other day. Sorry, Matt. So the guy says, "Hey, I loved your guiding principles. I want to use them for my organization." I said, e "No." <laughs> because he said, I want, I want permission to, 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 to plagiarize them. I said, you have permission to plagiarize them, but my guiding principles or the Santa Fe's guiding principles shouldn't be yours. You know, um, the guy was in some software. Oh, yeah. I, was, I was like, how can they have the same? And you have different people. You can start with these, but please let your people participate. Yeah, I, I I hear you, man. There's too much too much of this stealing and not asking why, but in you know instead asking a lot of how. You know, let me steal that, let me use that. And right, it doesn't fit well. Right it's, now you sound like Simon, my friend Simon Sinek with the why. Well, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I I get accused of that from time to time. <laughs> so I'm I'm hearing all this, and one of the things that really impressed me about your story is the continued success of the Santa Fe. And I know we haven't talked a whole awful lot specifically about the Santa Fe, but brag a little bit on, on what happened after you left and, you know, how, how did that happen and what happened with the next CEO and all that kind of thing? Yeah, well, well, thanks. And I, I think this is really important because we, uh, you know, the bumper sticker is we went from worst to first, which is, which is true, but I think that obscures the bigger picture. Um, hmm. I call that achievement. And I think you can, you, can, you can achieve things in a lot of ways. You can achieve great things in a top-down structure, especially if the guy on top is brilliant. Um, but what we were able to do was to embed the achievement, the, embed the capacity for achievement in the people and in this organization. So I left, and the ship continued to win awards. It won the best chief's quarters seven years in a row. And the guys got promoted at a highly disproportionate number. So at this point now, we have 10 officers who either been selected for command or already gone to command their own submarine out of, out of just the crew on the Santa Fe from the time I was there. That's a highly disproportionate number. That's and impressive. Statistically, it should be about two or three. Um, so, and, and, of course, so I think that's what leadership is. Leadership is embedding that capacity for achievement in your people and in the organization, not in your personality. What I like to say is once you have leadership, it becomes us following a set of principles to achieve a goal as opposed right. to you all following me. That's, that's huge. That's, that is, that's huge. And I think that applies to the church stuff as well. Oh, Big, big time. One of the one of the ongoing conversations in the church world right now is this whole idea of succession because you have you have a large group of 
baby boomer pastors who are getting up to the age where they're getting ready to retire and yeah. you know the question is how do how do we do this well and what I like one of the things that you you talk about is how um this I, I wrote this down word for word. You know, you said when the performance of a unit goes down after an officer leaves, it is taken as a sign that he was a good leader, not yeah. that he was ineffective at training his people proper, properly. Right. Right. And that's 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 huge. And right. a lot of times we don't we don't catch that. So the next the next CEO, and if you can't talk about this, that's fine. But the next CEO, I mean, how did he embrace the 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 philosophy that you had in place? on the Santa Fe. The next CEO was a genius. His name is Andy Hale. He came to the ship. He said, things are running well. I'm not going to mess it up. That's awesome. And so he continued. He, and uh, that was, I'm sure, one of the reasons why the ship continued to do well. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, man, this this has been very helpful. And I, I think, like I said, you're I b really believe that your book has a lot of application for the church world. And I'm planning on giving away a copy. Um, to to one of the readers of the, of the blog and you know before before we end this do you have any last words of wisdom for that you would like to pass on to our leaders yeah i i would say that um you you're going to slip up you're going to say hey i want to be this way i want to give my people power i i i don't want to be the kind of leader who is just telling people what to do and you're going to make a mistake you're going to get uh, frustrated your you, things aren't going to go the way you want and you're going to have a tendency to to take power back and 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 you may act on that you may say you know what i'm just going to make this decision but you know uh that's because you're you're human so that doesn't mean you're a bad leader. Just move forward. Try again. I had a, I had a, I had a poster in the back of my stateroom uh, to remind me of my own fallibility and simply to say that you may just maintain consistency over and over and over again and give them a little bit of control and make sure you're balancing it with organizational clarity and technical competence and then when that's successful, then give a little more, and then you give a little more. And yeah, you're going to have backtracks, and it's going to be messy. And I, and I worry in the book, it seems it's a little sort of preordained. Hey, fall of Troy, we know it's right. going to happen. Um, and, but in reality, we didn't know it was going to be successful. It was messy. So and that's the same thing for you. But I believe that just as humans, we have too many problems. The problems are too big to waste the brain power and the, and the mental capacity of, 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 of most people and to let people operate on 30, 20, 30 percent brain power, 20, 30 percent engagement, 20, 30 percent passion, 20, 30 percent um, initiative. And it's only going to be by those who have control giving control will we flip that around. Will we really be able to tackle the big issues that we have? That's great. Thank you so much for your time. Um, the book is Turn the Ship Around, and appreciate your time, David. Thank you. All right, man.